uh, from Connecticut. Uh, we are really uh, very, very privileged, and I feel fortunate to have this panel for a round table, even though we're not at a round table, uh, because very bluntly, we are just beginning to understand and learn more about the devastating effects of cyber breach and attack and the need for greater security. And we're very privileged to have with us uh, some real experts in this area. Uh, William Efron, who is the director of the Federal Trade Commission Northeast Regional Office, Evan Preston of Conperg, state director, Carl Anderson, who is the government affairs re representative for the Healthcare Information Trust Alliance, and Edward Chang, who has come from Washington. He's the counsel for national security and cybercrime at the executive office for the United States Attorneys. And I want to sp say a special thanks to United States Attorney uh, Deirdre Daly, who contacted the Executive Office of U.S. Attorneys uh, for us, and uh, I know of her tremendous interest in this area. And let me just begin uh, by saying that uh, the Anthem breach was absolutely mind-boggling, breathtaking, heartbreaking in its scope and scale, the level of intrusion and the potential harm that it can do. 80 million people across the country have records and information that are at risk. 1.14 million people in Connecticut are at risk as a result of this cyber attack and breach. And there may be no medical records, diagnostic tests that have been taken, but addresses for both email and uh, home addresses, other kinds of personal confidential information, most especially social security numbers. Social security numbers are in many ways the keys to the kingdom. They enable all kinds of other intrusion and invasion and identity theft. To its credit, Anthem has instituted some very important steps to protect its customers, including credit monitoring and insurance against identity theft, up to a million dollars, and especially welcome, protection for minors. So these steps are important, but they also remind us very vividly and importantly that we need to prevent these kinds of cyber breaches and security, not only at Anthem, but at Sony, at Target, at the University of Maryland, at universities, corporations, all kinds of institutions across the country. The simple fact of the matter is that information systems are under attack daily from hackers in Russia, teenage hackers in Europe or around the world, nation states, as we saw in Sony, uh, apparently from North Korea. And the, these kinds of ongoing attacks threaten our national security as well as our individual security. Cyber attacks may well lead to the next Pearl Harbor. That's not my prediction. It comes from some of our highest military officials. Here's a statistic that I think is very important to keep in mind. According to the Online Trust Alliance, 90% of these cyber breaches at private corporations are preventable. 90% are preventable. The cost, according to the Department of Justice, is about $24 billion. So we're talking about cyber heists and attacks and hacks that are preventable, extraordinarily costly in individual security and national security. And the question of what can be done to prevent them and what legislation or governmental action can be done to encourage private corporations and the, and the corporate world to do better. And by the private world, I mean not only corporations, retailers like Target and Home Depot, uh, private institutions like universities and colleges, but also across the board, 
hospitals, healthcare providers, all are vulnerable. Uh, we all would prefer for voluntary measures to do the job. But if voluntary measures are inadequate, the government has to provide direction and mandate. And I am looking into legislation that could require encryption, mandate encryption of these records so that breaches do not automatically put people at risk. That kind of protective action, strong, aggressive, robust, privately, as well as in governmental institutions, local and state governments, is tremendously important because all are at risk. The massive attacks ongoing from the teenage hackers to the nation states are all putting private information and national security at risk. So uh, I want to thank uh, all of our panelists for being here. And uh, maybe we can begin by going my left to right. I realize it's your right to left. Uh, Carl, why don't you lead off? Sure. Thank you, uh, Senator Blumenthal, for this invitation to participate today. And we look forward to working with you in your office and the Commerce Committee uh, as you consider that legislation. Uh, my name is Carl Anderson. I represent High Trust. Uh, we are the healthcare industry's leading information sharing and analysis organization, or ISAO. Uh, we have a number of different programs in this capacity, one of which is our Common Security Framework, or CSF, and that is the healthcare industry's uh, cybersecurity and privacy framework with 135 different security controls and 14 individual privacy controls that a healthcare organization uh, can apply to their systems. Whether it's fully scalable, so a Fortune 10 insurance company, as well as a sole practicing doctor provider's office can use that framework to apply to their IT systems. We do 10, over 10,000 assessments uh, with, these, with our CSF. We have a number of different other programs. We have something called the Cyber Information Coordination Center, or C3, which is the healthcare industry's information sharing and threat information sharing uh, mechanism, where we have a cyber threat exchange with our partners. Um, we now provide that free of charge. Anybody asking to sign up to receive those threat information uh, alerts and we have a number of different programs as well, one of which we're very proud to uh, highlight is something called CyberRx. That is a healthcare-based uh, cyber exercise that we started last year where you can do these mock uh, war games or a mock breach and you go through the steps of how you react within either internally or working with government partners and we're now rolling it out to uh, our second year and we're now going to have it regionally in different cities and based on perhaps uh, the senator's interest and the interest here in the Hartford area we'll, we'll add Hartford to the list we had sort of some of the you know West Coast and East Coast cities but maybe we'll add Hartford to the list uh, so that we can bring that level of attention here in Connecticut uh, Great. But we're working, we're looking forward to working with you uh, and especially your leadership on the subcommittee for data security, Senator. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, I should have mentioned that I serve on the Commerce Committee on the relevant subcommittee and I also uh, am on the Judiciary Committee which has a responsibility as well, as well as the Armed Services Committee because our military is under attack as well. Literally our Department of Defense every day is attacked and speaking of uh, the United States government. Um, let's go to Ed. Thank you, Senator. Um, my name is Eddie Chang. Um, I've been a federal prosecutor in Connecticut um, for the past 15 years, working primarily on cybercrime. And for the past year, I've been in Washington working on cybercrime issues as well as national security issues. And thank you to the Senator for putting this great panel together and giving us an opportunity to come and tell you a little bit about what the federal government is doing in these areas. Um, there are two points that I would like to sort of highlight. First is the announcement last week by President Obama of a new executive order in which you know, the government is taking steps to try to improve and increase the information sharing between the public sector 
and the private sector, and that was the highlight of the executive order last Friday. Um, and that's uh, and information sharing, we think, is probably key to trying to, as a senator suggests, to protect the critical information that is stored in the company's uh, computer networks across the country. Um, and so by increasing that information sharing, the government is doing what it can to try to be proactive and protective of that information. On the other side of the coin, what happens when the information is stolen is, um, is the government will investigate and try to apprehend the people involved. And we had some really good news uh, in that regard earlier this week as well. Um, some of you may recall a breach several years ago uh, involving a company named Heartland Payment Systems. It was at the time the, one of the largest breach um, ever to have occurred. And uh, one of the individuals responsible was extradited from the Netherlands on this past Tuesday and made his appearance in New Jersey District Court. Uh, for the ver for search first time where he will be facing uh, criminal charges for that breach among others. So it's, there are many aspects of approaching this problem. Um, protecting the data is one of them and um, going after the bad guys is another and we're trying to do everything we can in both, both respects. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, William Efron from the Federal Trade Commission. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Senator. Uh, I'm William Efron. I'm the director of the Northeast Region of the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, just prior to beginning, I just have to issue the standard disclaimer that the views I express here today are mine and don't necessarily reflect those of the commission or any individual commissioner. Uh, with that said, uh, the, the Federal Trade Commission is committed uh, to protecting consumer privacy and promoting data security in the private sector. And we've undertaken substantial efforts over the last decade to promote data security through law enforcement, uh, policy initiatives, and education. Uh, on the law enforcement front, uh, the Commission enforces several statutes and rules that impose data security requirements on companies. In addition, the Commission enforces the FTC Act's prohibition on unfair and deceptive acts or practices uh, where a business makes false or misleading claims about its data security procedures or where a company's failure to employ reasonable security measures causes or is likely to cause substantial consumer injury. Now, since 2001, uh, the Commission has used its authority under these laws to settle over 50 cases against businesses where we charge that they failed to provide reasonable and appropriate protections for consumers' personal information. These settlements have halted harmful data security practices. They've required companies to provide strong protections for consumer data. They've raised awarenesses about the risks to data, the need for reasonable and appropriate security, and the types of security failures that raise concerns. The Commission also undertakes policy initiatives to promote privacy and data security, uh, such as by issuing reports on technologies affecting consumer data. Uh, for example, recently, the FTC released a staff report about something that's called the Internet of Things, and this is a rapidly expanding phenomenon of day-to-day -day consumer products that connect to the Internet. Now, the report contains a series of concrete steps that companies can take to address consumer privacy and security concerns that are raised by these connected device, devices. In addition, uh, the Commission also promotes better data security practices through business guides and education. Uh, for example, we widely disseminate a business guide on data security. Uh, we also sponsor OnGuard Online, which is a website designed to educate consumers about basic computer security. Uh, also, for consumers who have been affected by recent data breaches, such as the Anthem data breach, the FTC posts information uh, online about steps consumers can take to protect themselves. And as this discussion ensues, we'll get a little bit more into the specific tips that consumers can take when they are uh, the victims of identity theft or are concerned about their information being compromised. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin? Thank you, Senator Blumenthal, and I'd like to thank the other members of the panel that are working at the federal level and to change the legislation that governs this space to allow consumers to protect themselves. Um, speaking for a con group in terms of what individual people can do in the immediate term to respond to this breach, there are a couple important things to highlight. And the first is that we're very closely monitoring the offer from Anthem for credit monitoring service that'll be provided to their customers. But I want to let consumers know that in this intervening time in which
which it's unclear who has yet been affected, we're advising people that you can put a security freeze on your credit reports. This is vastly less expensive than continuing the credit monitoring beyond the free period in which it's offered, and it also can be lifted if you decide to, at some point in the future, make a significant investment such as a home or a car. So putting a security freeze on your credit reports is a simple step that individual consumers can take as we wait for federal action, as we see what the industry is doing to respond. Um, and I'd just like to also credit here in Connecticut the Department of Revenue Services that put out important tips on getting your tax refund as soon as possible so that no one can fraudulently claim that refund for you. Um, those are two immediate things, getting a freeze on your credit reports for people and then watching your tax refunds immediately and getting that as soon as possible that individuals can do. Thank you. Um, let me uh, pose a question, and it sort of uh, comes from the, the comments, particularly that Evan and uh, William have made. Um, you know, a security freeze on credit reports enables an individual to stop a report, a credit report, that is necessary for someone to borrow because banks require credit reports before they will make loans. So if there's a freeze, Nobody can borrow in your name. But it also, in many instances, requires a fee. So in addition to the steps that Anthem is taking already, my feeling is that perhaps paying that fee so that credit freezes can be accomplished without cost to the individual would be appropriate. So I think Anthem, I would urge Anthem to provide for that fee, maybe work out with the credit reporting agencies a way that there would be no charge if there is a charge ongoing now. But number two, uh, the point that uh, we made, uh, the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is your refrigerator, your air conditioning system, your plumbing, when it's connected to a information grid that is linked to other people's homes, to the suppliers of those services, to a broader network which can put you at risk. We are no longer isolated islands in our information. We're no longer distinctly private entities so far as our information is concerned. We are linked and our homes are open to any kind of information sharing network. And once one network is breached, like Anthem, like Target, like a utility or a data broker, every individual who's linked to that person or entity is at risk because they are linked irretrievably and inevitably to the potential invasion. So uh, I'd like to pose for our panel uh, the question, and this is a prevention question. What can consumers do to protect themselves from the effects of breaches before they occur? In other words, we know 90% of these breaches are preventable. Should they be demanding that companies do better? Should they be protecting their own homes? What would you recommend? Anyone who wants to, I'm not going to call on folks. Well, Go ahead. There, there are certain things, I mean, and we, we, all, we, we have guidance on our own guide online, just for, for consumers just in general to be responsible and safe and secure online. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there are certain tips that we would always recommend, irrespective of, of a data breach. There would be, you know, would limit the ways in which you give out your information when somebody calls on the phone and asks for your social security number or your credit cards. That's something we tell people not to do. Right. When, when you have passwords for your accounts, make sure that you create strong passwords. Don't use the same password for all of your accounts. 
Uh, there are times that people, there's something called two-factor authentication, which consumers can avail themselves of, which is there, there's two points in which sort of a, a company checks to see that if it's you. So those are security measures that sometimes offer that people can avail themselves of. Um, you know, don't, don't limit, limit the ways in which you give out your information when you, let's say you receive an email. I'll give an example that relates to the Anthem data breach. Obviously, consumers have been victimized once, but then we're, we're warning consumers what, what's happening is, is people are getting emails now from companies pretending to be Anthem, saying, we're going to help you with your credit card monitoring, we're going to help you with this, so, you know, click on this link or give us your information. Now, Anthem has stated that they're not contacting consumers by email. What they're doing is, is they're going to contact people by U.S. postal mail and, and offer them credit monitoring. But, but this, is, this is another scam. This is something called phishing. It's where people are looking for to, to, to get your personal information and then you may become the victim of identity theft. So we warn consumers, do, do not click on that link. Do not click on that attachment. And, and, and delete that from your, your inbox. But first, we, we give an address to send it to when you get this type of spam. So you have to be careful just when you're on the internet that you, that you don't click on suspicious links. So I Very think those point. are some general preventative measures. That's an excellent point. By the way, the IRS does not call you on the phone. <laughs> if you get a call from someone and, you know, it sounds to folks up here somewhat absurd, but just last night, uh, two people came up to me at a public meeting and said, I'm really worried. My wife was called by the IRS and told she owed money. Another came up to me and said, uh, I was called by the IRS and they were asking to check my social security number. Now, you know, we, we smile, we laugh, but in the real world, Somebody calling from the IRS is pretty intimidating, and that can evoke people, cause people to to uh, give out that kind of information. But coming back to the question, uh, what should people be doing? Should they demand encryption from corporations like uh, Anthem or uh, Sony or Target or any of these companies? Well, just uh, spe speaking on behalf of you know, the consumer members that we have, steps such as encryption to have that provided by the firms which are getting access to consumers' most sensitive data, that we think is a reasonable step. And we've appreciated Anthem's response since then of providing the free credit monitoring. We think this is good. And one other thing just to mention though with that is that regular monitoring of your credit as an individual consumer. So the free credit reports that are available to you. And that if you space them out, you can get a third of each year. So every four months, you can get access to a free credit report to actively and preventatively monitor for fraud that may be drawn in your name. So those are, I think, two of the important things that I would thank the Senator Shrek. Very good point. Yep. Any other thoughts or recommendations to consumers? Well, I hope the internet is never connected to my house's plumbing, as you said earlier. But uh, in terms of encryption, I think that's certainly something that many companies could make themselves available of. I, I would be perhaps a little guarded to say that everybody needs to encrypt their uh, things, because at least in the case of Anthem, I don't know if the experts think that encryption would have even helped. It may have been that sophisticated of a step or a threat that encryption may not have actually even helped. But that is certainly one step and certainly a, a viable option or you know, proposal that should be on the table. And I think consumers are in the most difficult uh, situation here, not just with Anthem, but when they go to do business at Target or versus Walmart. Uh, because it, it could happen to just about anybody. But I think uh, with what Mr. Efron was saying, the consumers have to be ever vigilant uh, in this threat. We are now in the information age, and they need to know that as they're going and partaking in these new technologies and the Internet of Things, that they are making themselves sometimes more vulnerable to these uh, attacks just by using this you know, latest and greatest means of technology. 
But at the same time, I think if we are smart about it, we have certainly good standards and good hygiene uh, for the way in which we use that or best practices, I th hopefully we can kind of hammer out and level the playing field here with the people who are try trying to take advantage of these uh, technologies and of the consumers. And, and I should emphasize here, I want to emphasize, uh, Anthem was a victim. Yes. Right? Uh, so were all of these corporations. They were victims. Uh, some may have been more vigilant than others, but all of them are learning from past experience. They're learning from the breaches that are increasingly sophisticated and complex. So I don't want people to misunderstand me. Uh, Anthem responded very appropriately to provide remedies to consumers, and it was a victim. Which leads me to the question, maybe I should ask Eddie, how likely is it that we can apprehend, for example, the, the hacker in the Anthem breach? How, how capable are law enforcement authorities in apprehending and prosecuting these kinds of criminals? They're criminals. Certainly. Um, it's really difficult to say with respect to a specific case whether yeah. we're ever going to be prosecuting somebody um, but certainly the Department uh, of Justice, the FBI, the Secret Service are all um, focused on these cases and there are a lot of resources that are being put into play to try to go after the individuals who are responsible for these kinds of crimes. For example, the case that I mentioned earlier that, was, that is being prosecuted in the District of New Jersey, um, we've gotten a number of uh, significant su successes in pursuing high technology crimes, going after botnets. Um, and other, other kinds of people who, um, uh, other kinds of tools that are in, in involved in these kinds of crimes. But <clears throat> if I could go back to your earlier question about sure. what consumers can do to protect themselves, and, and this, again, um, everything I say is really my own pr perspective, not speaking for the right. government, but one thing that consumers really might want to consider doing, and there might be room for legislation in this area, is trying to, uh, you know, when you're saying that consumers need to be more aware, well, how can they be more aware? Maybe there ought to be um, better disclosure requirements for companies in terms of are they using encryption? So if you're going to be working uh, with an insurance carrier, how easy is it to find out how that insurance carrier protects your information? A very uh, classic example of this kind of thing is um, a lot of uh, phones, when you download apps, the, w when you install the application, it will tell you, okay, it's going to be using this, this, and this feature of your phone. Do consumers, and that's a great disclosure, that's right up front, when you download it, you can see what it's doing. And we should be having that, perhaps, in a broader area where disclosure is immediately made apparent so that consumers can see what is being done with the information. Consumers also need to make that decision, you know, I'm downloading this application. Do I want to give this application access to all my information, all my hard drive? Do I want to give it access to my geolocation information? So there's kind of a two, two parts of this problem. The information has to be available to the consumer, and then we need the consumers to actually take the responsibility and make informed decisions about where they're putting their information and how they're making it available. You know, uh, I think that's a very, very important point, the uh, complete disclosure, ready disclosure of what uh, a company or any institution is doing to protect consumers. One of the areas that has been most problematic for a lot of retailers are the use of the best practices or most modern technology to prevent the, the kind of breach that occurred at, um, at Target, uh, where the credit card swipe uh, technology evidently is a lot less secure than the chip and pin technology, which is in use in most of Europe. Maybe you can expand a little bit on that, William. Well, what, what, what I was going to say, I wanted to build off a point yep. that was just made is, so obviously we encourage consumers, okay, let's say you're using a Wi-Fi or you want to look for that encryption sign or you want to make sure that your information is, is securely transmitted. 
there, there are unfortunately times, though, when companies uh, make promises about the security that they have or the way that they uh, keep people's data secure, and they don't live up to them. And those are times that we, we do bring cases when, when someone says, well, your information is secure for us, but it turns out, and we charge that it's really not, and they didn't take reasonable and appropriate safeguards. So there's, there's, there's two issues with that. I mean, one is, is the notice they give, and, and the second is, is you know, we're here to make sure that they live up to the privacy and the data security promises that they make. Uh, and, and, and obviously, as we're talking about, I mean, some of these, um, you know, there, there's no perfect data security. We bring cases when people fail to adhere to what we charge are reasonable and appropriate security measures. So as, as you alluded to, some of these things are preventable. And we brought cases where there are multiple and systemic failures. It's not, it's not an isolated incident that, that can happen, but these are things where th th this is, we looked at a company's practices as a whole, mm -hmm. and, it, and it was not an isolated incident. Right. Good point. Um, what about um, the potential for legislation here? Do you think that there is a need to strengthen the present laws? to enable you and the FTC or the Department of Justice to better secure Americans? Well, um, And you've suggested one way that maybe we should think about it. Right, sort of, uh, and then that, again, I really have to emphasize that was I really know you're my speaking own for yourself, yourself, and you are. But, but uh, the, we're not holding the Attorney General responsible okay. for. But, but the administration uh, has yet. made several um, legislative proposals, on, yeah. as I'm sure you're aware, um, in this area. Um, there, there are three. One is to actually improve the criminal justice laws with respect to cyber, cyber crimes um, because they uh, could use some updating, particularly to deal with new forms of attacks like botnets. Um, uh, that, and uh, there were two other proposals involving um, increased uh, information sharing and also um, providing some kind of a national standard for data breach notification. Right. So when breaches happen, what, uh, what companies are expected to do. So certainly the administration is looking at these issues. In the past, as I'm true, where we have, we have advocated yep. for, certain, uh, for certain things, so I'll, I'll lay those out a little bit. Is one, obviously strengthening our existing authority, and that would be by, uh, first of all, giving us, uh, giving the FTC civil penalty authority. Uh, we, we have that for a couple of laws that we enforce specifically, but we do not have that over most companies in, in the data security area, so uh, th that, that's one thing. Uh, another thing would be giving us uh, jurisdiction over nonprofits. Uh, generally, we don't have jurisdiction over nonprofits, and as, as many know, uh, a number of these data breaches have occurred at uh, health systems or other nonprofit institutions, so uh, that, would, that would be something else. And we have also advocated for uh, rulemaking authority under the APA, and, and that would help us sort of move with the technology and move with the way that risks are changing. Uh, one thing that was mentioned before was geolocation. That was something that 10 years ago nobody could have ever thought would be, would be tracked, or should that be within the definition of the kind of information that would be covered. But now that's an issue in, in so many different cases we've brought where you, your, your information is being captured and A, you didn't even know about it, and, and, and people have made, companies have made promises saying, well, we, we don't capture that, or not telling people when, in fact, that's something that they do use and then give to advertisers or something like that. So that's an area where maybe rulemaking could help. And also, uh, the breach notification requirements. Uh, there are a number of states, I believe 46 states, that have breach notification laws, but nevertheless, national a national breach notification law would uh, would level the playing field under the right circumstances and also uh, would make it, it easier for businesses to comply. So a, a national breach notification law would be another thing. And the, the notification, as simple as it sounds, is really, really important because consumers can't protect themselves if they don't know about the breach. They can't be wary and aware, check their bills and credit reports if they don't know that there has been a breach at, for example, uh, target and in some of these instances, uh, not Anthem, but in some of these breaches, there has been a question about how quickly and effectively notice was performed. 
And, and, and that's obviously an issue because the sooner you get noticed, the sooner that a consumer can take steps to, to prevent fraud that, that can or will occur. So that's, that's very important. I mean, it, Evan and, and I have given tips, and, but in terms of, you know, yes, you should monitor your credit reports anyway, but the point is, is when you know that your social security number has been compromised, then you yep. are going to go get that freeze, put an initial fraud alert, get your credit report, monitor your statements, and do those things. So yep. the sooner you know, the better in those, in those situations. Yeah. Well, I think another key, Senator, is the information sharing piece. Uh, certainly in Anthem, they were able to self-diagnose uh, the, that they were having the breach. Normally, uh, as what happened in Sony and Target, uh, I think somebody else had to inform them or they've read about it on the internet. Uh, but here, Anthem was able to share uh, its indicators of, com of compromise with High Trust. Uh, and within a matter of hours, High Trust was able to take those indicators, send it out to their members uh, to alert them uh, that their healthcare company might be being attacked and then uh, that was able to also be shared with Department of Homeland Security through US CERT uh, who then disseminated it to the other sectors of critical infrastructure for that type of attack I think the information sharing piece mm -hmm. uh, is critical uh, but I don't want to lose sight of the issue that in most cases information sharing is only going to help those who are not the victims of the immediate attack Mm -hmm. uh, it is not going to be sort of the proactive steps that many companies have to take, which would be the good hygiene, making sure you have the right controls in place, making sure you know what to do in the event of a breach. It's really going to help the other non-victims, and in this case, either the healthcare industries or you know the other areas of critical infrastructure, at least to check, hey, mm -hmm. this is what happened to Anthem. It's not happening here, but that's also an indicator. And that's the type of level of uh, public-private sector information sharing that at least occurred correctly, you know, in a, in a good way uh, in this case, and that should be strengthened and emulated across uh, other sectors. Which, and it is happening. Uh, but what we're finding, I think, in some cases is the, the bureaucracy gets in the way on a few things, but uh, mm -hmm. we're looking forward to the opportunity to engage uh, on the information sharing piece, especially for the healthcare sector. As, uh, right. the leading uh, information sharing organization. And I think Eddie mentioned this too, the legislation, number of the legislative measures we proposed relate to uh, information sharing uh, as well as notification and providing standards and best practices. Yeah, HIPAA has a standard for disclosure when there is a breach. Uh, it's a 60-day notification. Yeah. Um, they also have any anybody who any entity that has over 500 uh, di individual disclosures, so a breach of 500 or more, uh, they get publicized uh, by the Department of HHS. Yeah. And um, the the notice requirement, which is also part of the measure that I propose, uh, is important because a standard nationwide really should be welcomed by a national company like Target or Anthem. And as much as consumers need to be notified, companies may have an interest in kind of keeping it under wraps for a while. Because, uh, well, as was said about one company, Target, uh, it wanted to minimize the public disclosure right before the Christmas, the holiday shopping season. And eventually it had an impact, but they waited until after the holiday season because they said they needed to investigate. Now, I'm not judging whether that was, you know, a legitimate reason or not. I take it at face value, but the point is that companies may not have an immediate financial interest in providing effective prompt disclosure. And, well, and we would support that we support the, the national notification, but we obviously wouldn't want to weaken anything. So we wouldn't want it, of course, to be strong right. enough because th there are laws in place. So yeah. that one caveat I, I would have. And, and, and in the Anthem Breach, Senator, they actually disclosed it within eight days of discovery, which is almost unheard of. Yeah. Uh, so they, they realized that this affected 
a number of, uh, of their customers and it was important enough to get out. Normally, they wait, you know, this 30, 60 days to fully investigate, yeah. but they knew it was that important to get out in front of it and share not only with the industry, the indicators, uh, but also their patients immediately once they could begin to identify that it was a real credible threat. Well, I think An Anthem wisely recognized that bad, do bad news doesn't get any better well, I, by waiting. Absolutely, sir. And the harm may only be aggravated. But, uh, uh, I think in many ways Anthem deserves credit for the way it reacted, uh, even as it and others in the healthcare area and in a lot of other areas are learning how better to deal with it. You know, I heard from one of the defense contractors uh, just within the past 10 days, one of our major American defense contractors, that they literally are attacked millions of times every month. They are attacked, and they don't know always by whom every month. That's the scale of the repelling that a lot of companies have to do, and they have very sophisticated systems to make sure that they are made secure. It's not just the defense industry yep. uh, center, it's the electric industry, yep. utilities. The, the utilities, yep. uh, the retail industry, healthcare in companies are also right. getting. Seeing and, that same and level accountant of firms. attacks. Sure. Accountant firms, uh, you know, literally companies have to be in the business of repelling and defending against cyber attacks uh, as part of their business plan. And unfortunately, it just takes one to get in. That's uh, right. And then all, you know, everything goes to waste. Uh, yeah. But. Uh, well, I, I really want to thank everyone who's here. I view this gathering as a beginning. Uh, I hope that I can enlist all of you Absolutely, uh, in the continuing effort that we will be making in the Commerce Committee. We had a hearing on this issue last week uh, and we're going to have additional hearings. I think the point that uh, you made, which you kind of uh, glossed over a little bit, but it's very important to me as a former Attorney General, is that we don't want federal legislation to preempt stronger state laws. Yes. In other words, first do no harm. We don't want, and I, the Department of Justice may not agree with me, but uh, I feel very strongly that preemption in this area is not a good idea as long as there's no inconsistency with the, the state <coughs> law. That stronger state laws, if they're consistent, should be respected. And if they have higher penalties, for example, that should be respected, just as it is in the criminal area. Um, and so I, I hope that uh, we can continue to work together and make sure that we offer better protection. And I can't tell you, uh, again, how grateful I am for you, Eddie and uh, William, and, and all of you for being here uh, and coming, coming the distance that you did. So Thank we'll you. continue this effort, and I hope that you will give me additional comments if you have any. Absolutely, and we look forward to working with you at High Trust going forward for the healthcare Great. industry. So. Great. Thank, Thank you, you all. The invitation. Thank you. Thanks.